This is book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, chapter six. By the way, did I go too fast through virtue? Would you guys, it's in the video from Tuesday. Would you guys like to hear a little bit more about that or are we cool for today's lecture? Kind of good? Kind of sort of? Maybe? Uh, okay, not sure. All right, we'll see. Okay, um, let me talk about virtue as a mean between two extremes. It is not an arithmetic mean. An arithmetic mean is halfway between two things. It's an average. Okay. Um, it is rather a relative mean with respect to the nature of the extremes. Okay, so let's take the virtue of courage. Courage is a mean between two extremes. Both of the extremes are vices. One extreme is an excess of this characteristic. We might call it rashness. The other is a deficiency. We might call it cowardice. Okay, um, or patience. Again, a mean between two extremes. On one side, we might have haste, that's the excess. On the other side, also a vice that might be sloth. One more, self-control. The two extremes are indulgence and asceticism. An ascetic is someone who cannot experience pleasure, okay? It's someone who's unable to enjoy the, the fine things of life. Okay, now, it is important to note that the virtue that is the golden mean between two extremes is not necessarily halfway between the two. Sometimes it tends toward one side or the other. From your personal experience, when you have felt courage, does it feel more like cowardice or does it feel more like rashness? Feels more like rashness, doesn't it? Okay, so we'll put it there. Okay, patience. Does it feel more like sloth or does it feel more like haste? Sloth, sloth right? You kind of have to like resist tendencies within yourself, so it feels more like sloth, okay? Uh, Self-control. Does it feel more like indulgence or more like asceticism? Okay. Asceticism, right? Feels more like asceticism, okay? So the phronimos, the prudent or rational person, will know where on these continua the golden mean of virtue happens to lie. Okay, and through practice, through repeated habituation over time, he or she will become better at whatever that virtue is and will come to embody it in his or her character. Okay, and I've mentioned this before, but let me point it out here again, just so that we're all on the same page. For Aristotle, character and action exist in a feedback loop. Character shapes action, and action shapes character. Okay, by engaging in an action, you develop a corresponding state of character. The character, once formed, then inclines you to engage in particular kinds of actions. Okay, so once you have formed a character state of self-control, it is easier for you to do deeds that are self-controlled. Okay, and um, if you do courageous actions over time, you will become a courageous person. Once you become a courageous person, courageous actions naturally follow. Now, for Aristotle, it is important to note that character is a stable thing. For Aristotle, human character states don't change very much over time. The way you behaved yesterday is probably the way you will behave today, and probably the way you will behave tomorrow as well, or something similar. Okay, Not too much variation. If someone has lied to you before, he will probably do so again. Um, if someone is a philanderer, he probably will keep doing that, okay? It, people don't change, certainly not very quickly and not very often. Okay, and Aristotle's view is that character once shaped is, you know, stable and lasting. You don't have to worry about getting up tomorrow and suddenly doing some heinous, horrible deed because your character is relatively stable and it's going to help protect you from such things. Okay, at least so Aristotle thinks. Now, I want us to talk a little bit about 
some objections to Aristotle. But before we do that, I want to focus on one of the conditions for virtuous action so that we have the last little bit of this on the table before we look at some objections. Okay, so if you note from the video on Tuesday, uh, we talked about four conditions for virtuous action. We're going to focus here on the last condition for virtuous action. This is in chapter three of book two. Chapter three of book two. I'm going to read from the beginning. Does everybody have your text this time? Good, good. Yay! Oh, happy, happy day. Prosper, do you have your text? Um, yeah, it's a PDF. PDF. Okay, everyone's got a text today? Oh, man, I'm so happy. Okay, yes, this is like booyah moment. Okay, uh, chapter three, uh, beginning of the chapter. An index to our characteristics is provided by the pleasure or pain which follows upon the tasks we have achieved. A man who abstains from bodily pleasures and enjoys doing so is self-controlled. If he finds abstinence troublesome, he is self-indulgent. A man who endures danger with joy, or at least without pain, is courageous. If he endures it with pain, he is a coward. For moral excellence is concerned with pleasure and pain. It is pleasure that makes us do base actions and pain that prevents us from doing noble actions. This is the beginning of chapter 3, book 2. I have the Ostwald. Do you guys have the Ross? Okay. Yeah, sorry. This is like the Living Bible version. You guys have like the New American Standard version? Yeah, it is what it is. Um, okay, so, but I'll explain it. I'll talk the passage. Okay, so here's what he means here. Aristotle is saying uh, an indication that a, an agent is virtuous with respect to a particular character state and a particular action is that the agent experiences pleasure in doing the virtuous thing. Okay, if the agent experiences pain at doing the virtuous thing, then the agent, then that is a sign that the agent does not have the full instantiation of virtuous character in himself or herself. If it is painful for you to do the self-controlled thing, that is a sign that you are not fully self-controlled. Okay, there is a struggle within you. The temptation is strong. And that's an indication that you are, you are not necessarily uh, fully virtuous. Okay, if, if, again, if it is uh, painful for you to, um, to be courageous or to do the patient thing or to be kind or generous or something, then this is an indication that you may be on the way to virtue but are not fully virtuous. Now, having said that, Aristotle does think that people who do virtuous actions, even after pain, are heroic people. Okay, they just do not have the full instantiation of virtue within them. Okay, so um, here's an example. Uh, if you have never smoked a cigarette in your life and you have no temptation when around cigarettes because you've never smoked a cigarette in your life, you are fully virtuous with respect to cigarette smoking assuming that that's vice. If you have a cigarette addiction, struggle against it and triumph, but still feel the pull of the, of the tobacco and the, the addiction that you have formed, you are a heroic person. But in an absolute sense, you are at a lesser state of virtue than the person who feels no temptation at all. Okay, everybody kind of track that, kind of follow intuitively? All right, now, Having said that, let me now talk about the objections to Aristotle. Are there questions or comments so far about any of these things? We are moving. Oh, yes. For the cigarette example, would they, would you say they find pleasure in resisting the cigarette, cigarettes and their addiction? Or right. Um, so for Aristotle, the, the deal with pain and pleasure is this. <clears throat> well, let me st just stick with pleasure and use that as an example. Pleasure is something that ought to supervene upon right action. It ought not to lead right action. In other words, um, pleasure is something that you should feel from doing the right thing. And if you feel pleasure at doing the right thing, that is an indication that you are virtuous. However, if you um, follow your pleasure as a decision-making um, rubric, if you do what feels pleasurable or something like that as a, as a decision-making rubric, that is not in itself a virtuous course of 
of action. In fact, often it's vicious. Um, it is something that you should experience after having done the virtuous thing, but it ought not to lead the virtuous thing. Okay, maybe that helps a little bit. Yeah, okay, good. Let's look at objections to Aristotle. <laughs> All right, Aristotle says, humans have states of character. These states of character are stable. They do not change very much from day to day. And it takes many, many, many habituations or repetitions in order for a particular state of character over time to improve or to, uh, to decline. Now, in contemporary psychology, a number of psychologists have taken up the Aristotelian challenge and have sought to determine whether that is the case. Okay, and maybe you remember some of these case studies from your psychology classes, or your intro to psychology classes. Let's start with um, perhaps most uh, famous experiments in behavioral psychology in the last uh, 60 or 70 years, the Milgram experiments. <laughs> Apologies if you've uh, already heard about these from your intro to psych classes. Okay, Stanley Milgram, a researcher at Yale University in the 1960s, sought to determine whether Aristotle was correct about human character. And so he put advertisements in the newspaper in New Haven, Connecticut, seeking men of all different professions and life stations, okay, blue collar, white collar, Carpenters, electricians, plumbers, investment bankers, attorneys. And he asked them to participate in a study in learning. Okay, and he only worked with male subjects, so maybe his results would have been different if he had worked with female subjects. On the day of the appointment, when they had signed up to participate in the study, they would show up at Milgram's lab. And there would be two people in the lab besides themselves. There would be Milgram and another person. And the other person was actually the ringer in the experiment, but the guys who responded to the ad didn't know this. Okay, Milgram would offer them like a little bowl with two slips of paper and they would pull one of the slips of paper and select a role in the experiment. And the slip of paper would say teacher on it. Both slips of paper actually said teacher, but they didn't know that. Okay, the slip of paper would say teacher on it. And so the experiment would begin. They would assume the role of teacher, and the other dude who was also there, not Milgram, but the other dude who was the ringer, would assume the role of learner in the experiment. Okay, and so um, Milgram would sit them down in chairs in front of a window. <laughs> okay, this is my effort to draw them on a chair. Okay. <laughs> Okay, better, huh? Okay. Um, and the learner would sit in a chair behind the window. <laughs> okay. And also be attached to certain electrodes. Okay? <clears throat> he wasn't really attached to electrodes. This was a part of the experiment. Okay, it was to a ruse to try to uh, dupe these guys. Okay, now in front of the window, there would be a dashboard with various dials and switches. And the experiment would begin. And Milgram would uh, give these guys a series of questions. <coughs> they would be told to ask the question of the learner. And if the learner missed the question, the experiment, uh, experimenter, per, experiment participant, the teacher, would be told to administer a shock, an electric shock. Okay, and so they would ask a question, the learner would miss the question. So they would deliver a shock. Okay, Tiffany. Milgram is like here. He's just watching. He's just watching, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's actually dressed in a lab coat in the experiments. And um, by the way, he never raises his voice. He always speaks very softly and in a, a cool, soothing tone. Okay. These two people are volunteers. These two people are volunteers, right? Although this dude's actually the ringer. Okay, volunteer, ringer, milligram. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, the dials over here 
would show, uh, they would go from um, mild shock to moderate shock to strong to severe to deadly shock. Okay? And they would ask, they would be given these questions, they would ask a question, Milgram would tell them to shock the learner. And when the learner answered incorrectly, Milgram would tell them, he would instruct them to increase the shock. Okay, and they would do so. And the learner would answer incorrectly, and Milgram would tell these guys to increase the shock. And they would do so. Okay, and so it would go. They would increase the shock, the learner would begin to writhe. Yeah. So the shock is not an actual shock. It's not an actual shock. He's not really. He's, he's, a, a, he's an actor. It's a ringer. The person looking out a window. Looking through a window at the. He can see him, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. These guys would writhe. They would grunt and groan in pain. And Milgram would instruct these guys to continue to shock the learner, and they would do so. And they would increase the shock from mild to moderate to strong to severe to deadly. Okay, and in fact, a large percentage of these guys shocked the learner to death. What percentage do you think were willing to go all the way to deadly and kill the learner? 66% of ordinary men coming in off the street within 20 minutes of being in Milgram's lab were willing to kill a human being. Okay, now that is like, that is shocking. This is a shocking result. They don't do psych experiments like this anymore. <laughs> because like it messed the people up and stuff and like they, they had like problems for the rest of their lives. <laughs> I don't know. I hope it would be a lower number. I think it, would be a lower number. it might be a lower number. But anyway, so like these guys would, um, they would break out in sweat. They would break out in sweat. They would plant their heads in their hands. They would say, God, please stop it. And yet they would continue to shock the learner. And Milgram never raises his voice. You can hear the audio online. Okay. Milgram says, please continue with the experiment. Or the experiment needs to go on. Please, please increase the shock. And these guys will shock the, the guy, the learner. Okay, truly startling. Does this suggest that character states, human character states, are much more malleable than Aristotle thinks? If ordinary people like you and like me, within 20 minutes of coming in off the street in a lab, when told to kill someone, are willing to do so, 66% of them at least, does that suggest that when we think to ourselves, you know, comfortable thoughts, I'm a good moral person. Does that suggest that in fact our character states are much more vulnerable than we think? Does that suggest that maybe our actions are shaped more by our circumstances than by some internal force like stable character states? Okay, let me offer you one more objection experiment. This is also a famous experiment, the Darley and Batson experiment. <clears throat> These experiments were conducted uh, about 30, 35 years ago on uh, young men training for the ministry. Again, uh, they selected men. I'm not sure why. Maybe they thought men were more, more violent. Young men training for the ministry, seminarians at Princeton Seminary, okay? And these men were uh, instructed beforehand that they were going to need to deliver uh, a, cu a couple of weeks Hence, a couple of weeks later, they're going to need to deliver a sermon in the campus chapel on the Good Samaritan parable. Okay, now everyone's familiar with this parable? Good Samaritan? Okay, Jesus of Nazareth tells a parable about the Samaritan. And the Samaritan is a dude who uh, is going along his merry way and finds a man along the side of the road who has been beaten by robbers and is lying there bloodied and bruised, beaten by, beaten by robbers. And the Good Samaritan is uh, a moral hero, Jesus says, because he takes his own cloak, gives it to the man, puts him on his donkey, takes him to a local medical clinic where the guy can recuperate. And Jesus commends his behavior at the end of the parable. Okay, um, That's the Good Samaritan parable. Well, these guys are supposed to deliver a sermon on the Good Samaritan parable. Okay, 
Now, the day of the sermon arrived. And there were three groups of guys, although they didn't know they were divided into three groups. Okay, There are three groups of guys. And the first group was told that um, the time of the chapel message had been moved up. And they now had five minutes to get across campus and deliver the, uh, the chapel message. Okay, another group was told they had 30 minutes. And another group was told that they had uh, 120 minutes or two hours. Three groups. Now, along the way to the chapel, there was a dude lying along the sidewalk, bloodied and bruised. How many of the guys in the five-minute group on their way to the chapel to deliver a sermon on the Good Samaritan stopped to help the bloodied and bruised man on the sidewalk? Zero. Really? No one stopped. In some cases, they actually stepped over the body <laughs> to get to the chapel and deliver the message. No, it was a zero. The five minutes were a zero, yeah. Um, the numbers are better here, so here and here, so it's like, um, it's like 30% here, and like uh, 50 to 60% here, so clearly the haste plays a role, but still, this is like a startling number, right? I mean, a bloodied and bruised person, and you don't stop, okay? Um, again, does this suggest that we human beings are actually much less moral than we'd like to think. And when faced with uh, you know, circumstances outside of our ordinary orbit, we suddenly become confused and disoriented and are unable to behave morally because our circumstances do more to shape our actions than some internal force like our character states. Let me throw that out there. What do you guys think? Who's right? Is Aristotle right? Uh, I guess I should have put it up here. Uh, character is stable. Human behavior tends to be the same from day to day, week to week, and year to year. Or are Milgram and Darley and Batson right? Character is unstable, and circumstances do more to shape our actions than character states. What do you guys think? I think there's a balance between the two. Balance between the two? Because, okay. Um, response or mm -hmm. in a way to preserve ourselves, then mm -hmm. we would tame our character um, or inherent behavior in order to protect ourselves. Because I think um, generally life tends to try to survive and you know, thrive and whatnot. So, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think there's a balance. Okay, so I love that comment. That's actually my view too. Prosper's view is my own. Um, humans normally have stable character. And when you go about your daily life, you know, if you were a rude driver on the highway driving to HBU, you'll probably be a rude driver, you know, today and tomorrow, uh, if you were yesterday, etc. But when we are suddenly outside of our elements, in circumstances like Milgram's lab, where we don't really understand what's going on, our character is probably a lot less stable than we'd like to think. And we are easily susceptible to suggestions from authority figures. Uh, Milgram also was motivated not just by uh, wanting to test Aristotle, but he was also motivated by trying to figure out, he wanted to figure out how ordinary Germans could, during World War II, suddenly become sadistic killers in concentration camps. People who were just normal, you know, butchers, shopkeepers, uh, electricians, uh, others, they suddenly become sadistic killers when placed in concentration camps. And apparently, it's not that hard, actually. <laughs> It looks as though human beings in, you know, different circumstances can suddenly... You guys have heard of, like, also the Stanford prison experiments? Yeah, yeah. yeah where, like, they have to actually stop the experiment because the, exper the, uh, the, the guards became so belligerent and they started abusing and beating the prisoners. The prisoners were, like, urinating on themselves in the corner and, like, cowering and stuff like that. It's kind of, it's kind of sad that um, humans can descend to that so quickly. Okay, other comments. Do you guys agree with 
Aristotle about stable character, or do you agree with Milgram and Darley and Batson about circumstances being more important in shaping our behaviors than our character states? Other comments? Okay. Uh, so the question is, who's right? Is Aristotle right about stable character? Or are Milgram and Darley and Batson right about character being secondary to circumstances in shaping our behavior? There have been other, other experiments, you know, like apparently if you uh, smell the scent of um, freshly baked bread, you are more likely to help the little old woman cross the street in the next five minutes than if you didn't smell that scent. Um, or, you know, if you find a dollar bill, you're suddenly put in a good mood and you say a cheerful word within the next three or four minutes then, uh, that you would not have said otherwise. Uh, these experiments, okay, so maybe they suggest that human character is determined to some extent by circumstances, but people can defy their circumstances too. Like character, you know, it doesn't have to be wholly at the mercy of circumstances. Uh, there are all sorts of people who, when faced with obstacles, uh, choose to act against those obstacles and do something contrary to them. Uh, you know, we call we call them heroes because what they do is sometimes improbable. But uh, still, there are a number of people who do such things. Okay. If you want to write a paper on that, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to write a paper on that sort of a thing, I would love to see a paper about that. Yeah. If at any point you guys think of paper topics along the way, by all means. Uh, you know, uh, write up a paragraph and send it to me, and uh, I'll let you know whether that would be a good topic. Okay, now, uh, we've got a couple other things I want to accomplish today. Here's the game plan for the balance of our time today. Um, we are going to take a little bit of a break right now, so a uh, two to three minute break. Um, we're going to come back and we're going to do a close reading exercise. Okay, so I'm going to take about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of class time. We're going to do a worksheet so we can do a close reading exercise and get some practice at reading the text. Okay, and then um, I'm going to lecture from book three. Okay, so that's our game plan right now. Let's take two or three minutes. We're going to take a quick break. <laughs>